Acts chapter 16, verse 11. Uh, we are making our way to, uh, verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. And uh, we are picking up where, where Paul is, is traveling. And in verse 11, therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran straight course to Samothrace. And then the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who met there. Verse 14. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us, She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord, watch this, opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Verse 16. Now it happened as they went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. For this girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did, verse 18, for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed... Turned, yeah, the apostles can get annoyed. Greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. Father, I ask you now to take control of my thoughts and my words. Father, we are so thankful your presence is here with us. Your presence lives in us. And Father, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That's just a fact. So, Father, I ask now that you would give us listening ears. Father, I pray against, in the name of Jesus, any distractions that might try to keep us from hearing what you have to say to each one of us. Father, anyone here who doesn't know your great love for them through Jesus Christ or online watching this live or or through the weeks to come, Father, we pray that you would draw them into your kingdom. And it is to the glory of our resurrected King Jesus, we pray. And everyone said together... Amen. You, as we talk about often here at Calvary Chapel, there are only two kingdoms in this world. There are a lot of nations. Nations come and go. Amen? But there are only two kingdoms since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. And we belong to one or the other. The door into the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. And anyone is welcome to walk through that door. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you belong to an eternal kingdom with a king. Jesus is our king, and what a king he is. He loves us. He can identify with our struggles. He can identify with our temptations, although he has never sinned. He's never fallen short. You know, Scripture also says he prays for us. I mean, talk about a prayer partner. He loves us. He is the God-man. And he has reached out to us and pulled us up by one hand, so to speak. And with the other hand, he is grasping the holy God and he brings us together because of the sacrifice he's made. Here in America, um, I remember hearing this years ago, uh, because we do a lot of work in Africa, as you know, that that Africans would come here, people from uh, other countries who were Christians. And they'd come to this country and they'd say, we're finally at a Christian nation. I mean, after all, on your money it says, in God we trust. And then they would see the culture and they would realize it's not a Christian nation. And then certainly our Constitution is based upon Judeo-Christian truths. But we are not a Christian nation. And what has happened is, the more that we have taken God out of the center of our consciousness as a nation the more that void will be filled by something or someone, and it has been. In Iowa, about a month ago, because of this freedom of religion, there was a satanic uh, statue put up. 
I mean, in their, in their foyer, in the rotunda, and a, a former uh, Navy, naval pilot, Christian, ca- came in there and tore it down. And, and he said, yeah, yeah. And he said, I would do it again and again. And he's, brought up, he's being brought up on charges for a hate crime. And he said, you know, if I'm going to be brought up on charges for a hate crime, there's nothing better than tearing down a, a, a statue of Lucifer. So it just shows you that our culture has shifted. Now, this is good news and bad news. The bad news is, is that we've drifted away from the Lord and America is under judgment. I hate to tell you that. If the stuff you're seeing right now, the delusion you guys are seeing, the irrationality, the unreasonableness, the lack of critical thinking, that is, and decisions that our leaders are making on both sides of the aisle, that is the result of God's judgment. It just is. Read Haggai. Read the Old Testament prophets. and They talk about how when his judgments come, your leader will make terrible decisions. I'm like, check. <laughs> you will be invaded by a foreign army. Check. And so, but that's the bad. The good news is this, is where darkness is, light shines brighter. So more, more than any other time in the history of this nation, this country, as followers after Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit sealing us. His light is in you. He wants to shine, if you will, through us. So this morning, at looking at these two kingdoms, we're going to see these two kingdoms clash. And we're going to see this servant girl who is being used by those who were her master. And by the way, slavery is not the same Um, slavery in the the Bible is not the same as slavery we had a couple of hundred years ago. It was was more servant uh, servitude. They were trying to pay off debt. But what we're going to see here is this clash between the God of this world and the Apostle Paul. And what can we learn from it? What can you and I learn from this? So let's get into Scripture. We see here in verses 11 through 15... Paul is talking about his, his continued travel, and they go to Troas, uh, they, they go to Philippi, Philippi, um, and in verse 13, um, they, they're there in Macedonia, and they're in a colony there, there's no, there's no tabernacle nearby or t- temple for them to go and, and, and pray, and then it says, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to a woman who we met there. Now, folks, what we're going to see here is what is often called a divine appointment. Now, when we say divine appointment, we're just talking about how it is that God sets up a time or an appointment for you to meet someone because he wants to further his kingdom. Does that make sense to you guys? So what happens here, he meets this woman, verse 14, named Lydia, and she sold purple, which was fine uh, silk and stuff, and and she was worshiping God, and then the Lord opens her, her heart, and she heeds what Paul has said. And then now, verse 15, she, she says, listen, I want you to come stay with us. Now what God would do is he would open the door through Lydia's family to go into Europe and spread the gospel. That is what we would refer to as a divine appointment. And might I encourage you all to understand that God has these appointments for you. You are part of his kingdom. You are a walking, talking temple of of the Lord. And if you're paying attention, now this is my challenge. Sometimes I just don't pay attention. Like I'm in my own little world. It's like I got those, what are those things they put on horses called? Blind, is that blinder? It's just, I'm just kind of, I just want to get in out, out of Walmart, please, you know? And just, I just want to, I want to go home and, and, you know, rest. And I can do that. But when I'm open to what the Lord wants to do, it's amazing what he does. Cornerstone story for you. By the way, go to Cornerstone and buy coffee. They have bagels. This is a shameless commercial right now. (laughs) But all proceeds go to missions, right? So so I was in Cornerstone. It was packed. We were having lunch. And this gentleman walks in with this big old beard. And that, some of you may not want to remember the day that I had that beard. You know, I'd have people walk up and give me quarters. Did I see you? Uh, you know, so, but I had this big beard. My wife couldn't stand it, but I had this beard down here. And he walks in, and I go, dude, nice beard. I didn't know who he was. I thought what I was doing, I was trying to grease the rails to share the gospel with him because I'd never seen him in there. He's big, oh, yeah, hey, dude, nice beard too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I'm sitting there talking to whoever I was fellowshipping with, and I just like trying to open up a, a dialogue with him. And um, we're talking, and he mentions Entebbe, which is the capital of Uganda. And I'm going, what? He goes, yeah, yeah. I goes, you, you've been to Uganda. Now, we've been to Uganda probably about 15 times. And um, so he goes, yeah. He goes, in fact, we had a layover there, and we were watching. We were in this little room, and we were watching President Obama give his acceptance speech. And I'm like, what? You guys want to hear something crazy? I was in the same room at the same time. And I, and I remember looking around the room, and I remember looking, it was because it was full of Ugandans, and I remember looking around the room, and there's about three or four uh, whites in the back, and I thought, oh, they're Europeans. And I go, you were there, you gotta be kidding me. So this is about 7,000 miles from here, and we became friends, and he knows, he knows our worship leader, Nick. I didn't know it at the time. But my only point is simply this. If you pay attention, the Lord will open these doors. And, and as, as America grows darker, we, when you're part of God's business, he will, he will begin to move the chess pieces more and more and more. So just, can you just be open to that? Can I get an amen? amen. So we see this example of what a, a divine appointment. Now, I wanna show you the scripture. You guys know the scripture, but I love this. A man's steps are of the Lord. The man step, my steps, Lord, you lead my steps. When I want to be obedient to you, you guide my steps. How then can a man understand his own way? You know what he's saying? He's basically saying this. You follow me, you'll be clueless, but I'll guide you. You, be, you don't know what you're doing, I get it. But just, I will guide you to where I want you to be. It's such a wonderful promise, and the older I'm getting in the Lord, the more I see that. It's just being led by Him. Now, when I was a younger Christian at the age of 16 and, and growing in the Lord, I always thought I had to figure out how God's going to lead me. No, no. It's not doing, it's being. It's being a child of the Most High God, and He will lead. So just a wonderful scripture. Now, let's get into the heart of our message. In verse 16, it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, now watch this, possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit uh, by fortune telling. So right here we see possession. Look at me, all believers. As a follower after Jesus Christ, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are owned by God. You cannot be possessed by any other spirit. Can I get an amen? amen? You cannot be, Christians cannot be, can they be influenced by? Can they be oppressed? Yes. Can they open doors to the enemy? The scripture says, chapter four, verse 26, don't let the sun go down on your anger lest you give a foothold to the devil. Well, a foothold is a foothold. Foothold means I allow him in my life, and I've done this before, and I've experienced it where I allow a foothold in my life and all of a sudden my mind's just going Zee! and until I repent and rebuke that stuff, I have to struggle with it. And so we can give a foothold to the enemy. Now watch this, here is a truth and all the demons know this. If you have a foothold in your life, then permission somewhere has been given and once that permission, that permission's been given, there's no permission that can't be canceled. Are you with me? And then once that permission, whether I open the door or whether something's happened in my ancestry, and I'm not talking about possession, I'm talking about the demons will track, there's, there's, no, there's nothing that I can't cancel in the name of Jesus. And then once it's done in the name of Jesus, demons, they realize this, this is the rules, they gotta go, and they know they gotta go. So we're gonna talk about this more as, as we move on. So we, we see here that the, the spirit of divination and fortune telling, in other words, this is kind of, I mean, we see this all the time. You guys ever been to a city where they're like, you know, get your fortune or your hand, what do they call it, palm reading, and, and tarot cards and all of that, and I, I, I don't think I need to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. 
God absolutely tells believers, you have nothing to do with that. You don't look at your horse. Look at your horoscope. Oh, I'm just looking at my, I've had Chris's, I'm just looking at my horoscope. I'm like, why would you look at a horoscope the way the stars are aligned rather than looking to the one who aligned the stars? I mean, why would you do that? And who, who, what difference does it make when you were born? I mean, I was born in May, which means nothing except I was born in May. That's all it means. That's when my mom gave birth. This is it. That's it. Doesn't, it has nothing to do with my destiny. The one who created me, he has everything to do with my destiny. So as a believer, if you've been involved in this stuff, Ouija boards, you, you, some, sometimes if you're, getting, if you're getting hassled still, just go back and say, you know what I do remember? I did. Lord, I repent of that. Lord, I take back ground. Lord, I confess that sin. And, and you, you, can, you can take back that ground. If you're still struggling, come and talk to us. But, but we see here the spirit of divination brought to it by her for profit. So they're making a profit, fortune telling. Now, watch this, fortune telling, telling the future. The demonic realm will do their best. Lucifer will do his best to imitate God. So the Antichrist is not, the Antichrist isn't, when he comes up, and he might even be on the earth now, he's not going to come running out with a pitchfork and red horns and go, I'm here, here I am. <sighs> You're not going to do that. <laughs> Antichrist means counterfeit Christ. So this, when this person comes on the scene, he's going to be a peacemaker. He's going to sign a peace treaty. Daniel tells us all the details of this. So he's going to appear to be a uniter. But, he, but that's false. So with this spirit, the scripture says spirit, a demon of divination, a fortune telling, they're trying to imitate God's gift of prophecy. And that is a gift that we looked at this in Joel last week, that God, that your young men, uh, um, your young men shall prophesy, and young women, you'll, they, they will see visions, your old man shall dream dreams. So he will always try to come in and copy what God does. Can I get an amen? amen? So it's an imitation. And they're making a profit. So they're making money off it. Now you go back to the garden. And you go back to the original deception. And what was the deception? Satan, Lucifer's observing Eve. And Adam and Eve were literally in a garden. It literally happened. There was incredible fellowship between God and man. And the, uh, Lucifer comes and says... So what did God tell you? Well, of the tree, we, we can't eat. No, oh, no, 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 no. No, here's what God's doing. He's hiding something from you because he knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like, you're gonna experience something. Oh, they experience something. But you're gonna experience something. And then you fast forward to Matthew in the New Testament and what, what does Satan do? This is Lucifer. He takes Jesus up to the pinnacle. And, and we, we, we wonder why it is that, that, he, that Lucifer was so bold. Why so bold? Because he knew who Jesus was. Well, Jesus is now the God-man. He was in the flesh. Lucifer had never seen him in the flesh. Are you with me? So maybe Lucifer is trying to go, okay, we're going to put you to the test. And what does he say? If you are the Son of God. If. So he's questioning his identity, trying to rattle Jesus. But what's the last thing he does? He takes him to a high pinnacle. He says, cast yourself down, Lucifer says. And don't worry. And he uses scripture. His angels are charged over you. They won't let you stumble. And then Jesus counters. But the scripture also says, you shall not test the Lord your God. And then he says, in my vernacular, he says, get lost, buddy. Get out of here. So he, he, he promised when he took him up to this highest highest uh, peak, um, oh, well, later on he took him and he showed him the glories of the world. Now watch this, the glories of the world, all the riches, all the glory, and now watch this, those who get involved in witchcraft, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for power, glory, riches, and so she is literally this, this ATM machine for these guys who, are, who, who, who uh, she's under, and then in verse 17, it says, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, 
These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, when you first read that, don't you kind of wonder, isn't she telling the truth? Isn't she telling the truth? I mean, so, so what's the problem? Well, you can tell the truth about something and be really irritating and have an ulterior motive. And that's what we don't get here with the black and white ink on the page. She was following them around and, and it became an irritant. And that's your first sign. It became an irritant to, to Paul. And he turns around and, of course, he rebukes this demon. And um, so, verse, we move on. Verse 18, uh, let's see. And this she did many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit. Now, we'll notice he's speaking to the spirit, not speaking to the girl. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And that, that, that very hour, she came out. So, watch this. This woman, this girl, who was being followed day after day, was following the Apostle Paul, giving this message, although it wasn't inspired by the Lord, and she knew it was a demon, he turns around and just goes, in Jesus' name, out now. You have no choice, get out, and that very hour she's gone. So this demon followed Paul with a message. So the question I want us to ponder this morning is, what messages plague you? This message was from the enemy now what, in our lives, what messages can plague us? What, what is that yapping out there sometimes that tells us that you're never gonna be good enough? And by the way, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, the idea of us being good enough, I think that's just a play the enemy makes, but, but l- let me write an addendum to that, that message, and that is that it has never been about us being good enough. You can't be good enough. So the idea, watch this, the idea of me being good enough is not even on the table. Can I get an amen? Amen. Jesus is good enough. I'm in him. That is the whole message of the gospel. I can never become good enough. But what the enemy will do is he'll come along and like this little servant girl just yapping away, following you around, you'll never be good enough if people really knew what you were like and, and God loves everyone else but you and we can be plagued by these messages. We can be plagued, and, and so what message plagues you? And as I've been praying about this message this morning, I was like, Lord, just show your people the lies that are being told. Show, the, show them. You know, over the last two or three years, we've, we've had mature believers um, come to me, and I've just seen this pattern opening up. And they're saying, you know what, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I mean, these are people that are solid in their faith. They're like, you know what, I'm, I'm just under attack, I think. I don't know, these thoughts are coming and even suicidal thoughts and all this kind of stuff. What is going on? It's the yapper. It's that little servant girl yapping away. Am I making sense this morning? Yeah. Does that make sense to you guys? So let's draw our attention uh, to the overhead And in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, it says this, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, look at that first sentence because this is vital for you and me to know. It talks about how it is they're they're people, even in Paul's day, that are not followers after Jesus Christ, but they're gonna make themselves out to be leaders in the church, even apostles, but they are not. They're false. So question, church, question. Do you know, can you discern a false teacher? If I stood up here right now and gave you a false teaching, my prayer would be, since we've been doing this for 34 years, taking you through God's word, my prayer would be that one of you would stand up and go, you're wrong. Ah, I get the security. <laughs> no, listen. No one is above question when it comes to the truth except Jesus. And any leader in the church of Jesus Christ is only worth his or her salt as they point you to Jesus. People come to you for advice, give them advice, but point them back to Jesus. People come to you and say, how am I saved? 
Point them to Jesus. The people ask, how do I know the truth? Point them to Jesus and his word. So we see here that even false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Do you see them today? I see them. I see them. Biblical Christianity stands alone. And when you look at Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Hindu, Islam, Christianity is completely different, although all these these other religions have things in common. And the number one thing a lot of these religions have in common is you work your way, you become good enough, you earn your way to heaven. Christianity says you cannot. Otherwise, the cross is void. Otherwise, what Jesus did on the cross is void. But then my salvation, my forgiveness, is as good as Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And and since he did resurrect from the dead, I can't wait to go. To heaven, that is. So, the second point is, for Satan himself transforms transforms himself into an angel of light. Oh, Oh, so you've had a spiritual experience. Ah, oh yeah, it was beautiful, it was wonderful. This, this being came and it showed, oh yeah, I don't doubt your experience at all. What was the message? What was the message? In Mormonism, they have this thing called a witness. And what happens is someone from the past will appear, literally appear to someone and say, Mormonism is the right road. Joseph Smith was a prophet. No. Satan can appear as an angel of light. When we were in South Africa, I told you guys this story when we got back. Um, we were taking some of Dennis Wadley's staff who are South Africans, uh, dark, dark skin and, and brown eyes, obviously. And we were taking this young person through the process of, and I don't think he was saved, but he was working with his team. And um, as we were talking, uh, we were addressing the demons. I, I, I was sitting this, sitting here, Dennis was there, and another leader was there. And I saw his, his eyes were closed, and I saw his pupil, because you know, your pupil kind of sticks out a little bit. So on his eyelid, I saw his eye begin to move like this. And I'm like, okay. And then, and then so, but I'm intense in, in the dealing with the, the spiritual aspect of it. And then he opened his eyes. He's looking down, opened his eyes. His eyes were a blue that was, trans, that was I, ca- I can't describe it. Um, it was coming from inside out, not because uh, usually our, our color gets reflected because of the light that's on them, you're with me? This is coming from the inside out. And because I was dealing with this, this thing, I didn't really take note of it till later. And, um, but I thought to myself, I thought, you know what? If I was into witchcraft, and I saw that, I'd be like, oh, because you know what? In a strange way, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful color. So Satan can appear as an angel of light. Don't be deceived. What is the message? And a lot of times when, when angels appear to, 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 um, to, to believers in the Old Testament, you'll see that in the New Testament. They, they'll either have instruction, they're there for protection, or if they have a message, it's always pointing to the Lord. Can I get an Amen. They never, they're never there to give their own message. They're never there to give, that's not from the Lord. So if someone comes to you, give them their message. Don't, don't accept it. So he can appear as an angel of light. And then also in John chapter 5, verse 19, for we know that we are of God. We belong to the Lord. Amen? And then in, in the next verse is, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I looked up that word whole world, And you know what it means in the Greek? Whole world. world. The whole world. So so you look around today, and why is there such insanity? Why is there such absolute insanity to where we're denying history? We're doing these things that, that if you don't, listen, if you don't agree with my view on something, you are the most horrible person in the world, and I'm gonna put a phobia on you, To where if you speak up in the town square, you will be shut down and canceled. What is that? You know what it is? 
It's Germany, 1937. That's what it is. Just know your history. But, but what, it's a really interesting, now, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you a governmental issue and a leadership issue. If you want to really confuse people, you, you accuse them of doing what you're doing. Because that really confuses them. That really confuses people. Accuse them of what you're doing because then people go, huh, what, huh, huh, and then you've always got them doing this the whole time. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And then John 10, 10, you guys know this verse. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So the enemy will try to come with this the abundant life, the life that God has given you, peace, joy, patience, kindness, and he will come and try to steal, he'll try to, kill, he'll try to kill it, he'll try to destroy it. So these are vital issues that you and I must, must, uh, must absorb. And let's look here when he says here, um, verse 18, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and he came out of her that very he he came out of her that very hour. Your attention up here quickly, please. Watch this. The name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe. And when it comes to the demonic realm or Lucifer himself, they know that and they know they have to bow to that. And so it's his name. Now watch this. Jesus is the creator of all things. It's in Colossians. All things are created through him. So Lucifer was created through him. So who do you think has more power, the creation or the creator? So you being in Christ and you using his name, they, they know that. They absolutely tremble. I think here at Calvary, we've taken about 180 people through this process, and people have just found incredible freedom but it's only because of the name of Jesus, because it's a name, as you know, above all names. And the only power, now watch this, the only power Satan has is in the lie. That's the only power he has, is to get you to lie. You know when scripture says, uh, be alert, and Peter, be alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Roaring lion, seeking whom he may what? Devout. Roaring lion. Now, I don't know, I don't know if you, you guys know, but they also have teeth. But here's the deal. With you, he doesn't have teeth. All he can do is roar at you. All he can do is lie. He can't sink his, te- sink his teeth into you. He is powerless against the one who stands with Jesus, but he can roar. Years ago, when one of my nephews was just a little boy, uh, Sharice and I took him to the San Francisco Zoo, and it was feeding time for the lions. And you go into this enclosure, and there's cages all around, and they let the, the lions in, and as they're waiting for their meat to come, they start this, ooh, 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 ooh. And you're sitting in there, and I promise you, the air is vibrating. It's so loud. And we were surrounded by this, and our little nephew's going like this. I'm like, yeah, buddy, let's run. And uh, and all I need to do is run faster than you. Anyways, no. But I'm just like, it's just like, and I'm sitting there going, that is, if you were in a tent on the Sahara, right, and you hear that, it's like, bye-bye, world. You know, just make it quick. But that's what it'll do to the enemy. And as you grow in Christ, as you grow in the Lord, those lies will just be there. You're not good enough. You're not really saved. Jesus didn't really, he doesn't really love. You made one, until one day you stand up and you just go, you know what, I'm not playing this game anymore. I'm not gonna play this game. And he'll keep coming at you. Now remember what Jesus told Peter. Remember? Satan has asked for you, Peter. Uh, Excuse me? Yeah, I just got a text from him. (laughs) He's asked for you, and he's going to sift you like wheat. What? Now, Peter failed horribly, didn't he? As he should have, because he was dependent upon himself. 
Jesus, all the other guys are going to deny you. They're all going to deny you. But Pete, Pete, Jesus, look at me. Pete, the rock, come on. I will never deny you. And then he denied him how many times? Three times. So when Jesus meets him back in the Galilee, at the Sea of Galilee, how many times does Jesus ask in front of the others, do you love me? How many times did he ask? Completely restoring him. Question, did Peter make mistakes after that? Oh, yeah. Because the sifting continues. And the the Lord will use this in our lives. He'll sift these things out. And he's doing it in my life. He's been doing it this last week. He's after something in my life that I'm not even sure. I I thought I'd taken care of. And there it is. It's a sifting, sifting, sifting. I'm like, ah, I don't like this process. I just don't like it. You younger Christians, if you ever think you're going to get to a point in this life where you're not going to be sifted, sorry, it's going to continue. But the Lord's in control of it. Vital that we see that. Vital that we understand that. So the lie only belongs in, or the power rather, only belongs into the lie. Let's look at scripture here. What's our, where, where do we stand with all this? Watch this. Where do we stand when it comes to the enemy? God speaks to Isaiah, fear not for I am with you. So he's with you. Don't be dismayed for I'm your God. The word dismayed has the idea of just being totally discombobulated totally disoriented anybody ever feel totally disoriented yeah okay ready right so totally disoriented he says don't do that so this command tells me when i start getting disoriented don't be disoriented because i am with you yes i will help you now watch this i will uphold you with my righteous right hand he said i'm gonna hold you with my righteous right hand so notice it says righteous he makes you righteous He's holding you up with his righteous right hand. You are righteous in Christ because he is our righteousness. He's our righteousness, okay? And then I will uphold you. And then I love this next verse, John chapter 10, verse 28. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So what God does, he goes like this. He goes, he's like, hey, devil, try to get them. Uh, 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 come <laughs> Come on, keep trying, come on, keep trying, keep trying, right? You ever do that game with your kids? You're like, give me five, hey, whoa, <laughs> And then they get to the age where they, they get it, it's like, oh, darn. But anyways, so you are in God's hand. So if you're in God's hand, can Satan get to you? No. Can his lies get to you? Yes, because he's a bully. So let's look at some, some ways the roaring lion works, and these are very rudimentary points but then you guys know them. But we see here, first, did God say, did God say, in other words, he just simply questions the word of God. He just, that's all he does. He just muddy the waters, just question. Second one is obvious, there's a temptation. A tempting, he does that as well. Sometimes we tempt ourselves, but he's a tempter. And then in the book of Revelation, it says he's the accuser, the accuser of the brethren. He accuses the brethren before God day and night. Wow. Did you see what he did? That's one of yours. Yeah, uh-huh. Someone cut him off on I-70. Look at him. Oh, he's praying all right. Yeah, look at him. Now, the interesting thing about Satan is, watch this. He'll tempt on this side. Then when you give in, he'll accuse on this side. And then the final one, and this is what I really want us to see, and we're going to be done in about three minutes, stay with me, is fear. Questioning God's word, of course, that will lead to fear. Tempting into sin, accusing the brethren, absolutely, but fear is a number one thing that I have seen that that, uh, believers need to break through when they're dealing with full-on frontal attack of the demonic realm, fear. So here's what I want, we're gonna do this in just a second. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven. God gave us a spirit. He's given you a spirit, but not of fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. You guys ever feel like you're gonna lose your mind? Oh, if you've had toddlers, come on. (laughs) Or if you're waiting in line at Walmart and 
Price check on aisle five. You're like, I got in the wrong line. Have you guys seen that? Got on the line, and every line shrinks, but yours. And then, have you ever gotten in another line, and then that line doesn't move? Price check on. Then you look at the other line, like, ah, ha, 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 Sound mind. So let's all stand together because we're going to read this God's word together. Let's all stand, even overflowing. Stand up. We're going to read this together as a proclamation of what God has done, God's truth. So we're going to go back here. Ready? One, two, three. For God gave us a spirit, not a fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Let's go back. We're going to do it again. Ready? One, two, three. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. So when a fear comes upon you, you know that's not from the Lord. I mean, if you're out playing in the street, you're going to get hit by a car and you have fear, that's on you. But I'm talking about things, watch this. I'm talking about things coming to you like all of a sudden this fear comes. But now he's given us power. The word is, the root word is dynamite. He's given us dynamite and love. I'm loved and a sound mind. Let's read it one more time. For God has given us a spirit of fear. Oh, I messed it up. Sorry. Hold on, hold on. God has to give me a spirit of eyesight. Hold on. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Let's give the Lord a big old hand clap.